this presentation, uh, it's evolved kind of over time. And, and what you'll see is it's uh, what I define as an abstract is maybe a little, little bit more liberal than some people. Um, I, I see it as when you're taking a photo of something and you're trying to show it in a different light or different vein, it's maybe not always immediately recognizable as to what it is. Uh, sometimes it is. Uh, so you'll see kind of a, a real assortment in this presentation. Some of these are clearly close-ups. Uh, some of them are different in-camera tricks to uh, create abstracts. So try to put a whole variety of stuff in here to just give you hopefully inspiration for a lot of different ways that you can see the world around us uh, in a different way. And then I also have a, a few behind the scenes photos in here too. Um, so I kind of show you uh, what the regular person passing by sees versus what I saw. So let's jump into it. Feel free to stop me at any time with questions. I prefer to just get them throughout the presentation. Uh, so just unmute yourself and, and chime in with a, a question. Um, I, I can probably tell you camera data stuff if you want, uh, but I suspect more you'll just have questions about the, the photo or taking the photo. So anyway, feel free to stop me anytime. There we go. So I'm gonna start with this quote by one of my favorite photographers, Elliot Irwin. And it's it's actually interesting that I use his quote because Elliot did a lot of street photography, which I actually, I don't do too much of. Uh, yet a lot of my books um, are about, have people photography or street photography. Um, and I guess I'm inspired by all kinds of photographers, all kinds of work, even though I just don't necessarily shoot that kind of work. So maybe that's one of my starting advice is that just because you're a landscape photographer, don't only study landscape photographers, study other genres. Or if you're a portrait person, don't just study portraiture, study other stuff. You can get inspired by all kinds of people. And I'm not monitoring the chat. So, so Sandy, if someone does uh, say something in the chat, just jump in and let me know there's a question. Yes, I am. I'm monitoring it. Okay, thanks. So let me start. So back to this quote here. So uh, I saw this quote many years ago, and it really resonated with me because I've always tried to, uh, kind of like Sandy was saying, see, see things differently than a lot of people around me. Uh, so this quote, to me, photography is the art of observation. It's about finding something interesting in an ordinary place. I found it has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. And so hopefully from this presentation, you'll learn a little bit how I see things and maybe it'll inspire you to see things uh, in your own unique way, but hopefully different than the rest of the people around you. And it looks like we have one hot mic. So people just check their mute. Um, so I'll start off with this photo. So this is uh, pretty much right out of the camera. Um, I was on a business trip to California and I had some free time and I brought my camera. And so I went to sun a place called Sunset Beach, a very pretty place to watch the sun go down. And I really like the colors in the sky, but I need some other ele element to go with it. Um, yeah, Arthur, I've got Arthur it. could you uh, mute? Okay, thanks. Um, so I really like the pretty colors in the sky, but I need some sort of foreground element or something else going on in the photo. Um, so I saw this uh, lifeguard station and I, I like the, being an engineer, I'm all about angles and straight lines. Uh, so I like the geometry of it. And so this is my first, shot I took. And like I said, this is right out of the camera. This is not processed or anything. And I liked it, had some good elements, but for, it wasn't really speaking to me as what, what I wanted. I wanted that mix of the beauty of the sunset along with the geometry I was seeing. And so a lot of times when I get into this dilemma, it's when I go in closer, right? How can I isolate down to just the bare amounts of elements to, to merge the two things together. So for me, I focused on the stairs in the lower right part of the frame. I really liked the, the, the lines there and I thought that'll make a good element. So this is the final image uh, that I took. So you, you don't necessarily know it's a lifeguard stand anymore. Obviously it's, it's some type of wood frame. You can, you can pick that up, but that's really not the purpose of this. The purpose is you show the colors, and then we have some lines, horizontal, diagonal, we got shadows, some just different things to offset it to kind of make it a unique picture, um, just merging those two things that I saw together. Um, this is uh, Chicotique, uh, or Acetique Lighthouse in Virginia. 
Um, and this is actually an iPhone shot. Uh, I was with my family and we were going to go hike up the, climb up the lighthouse. And this is taking at you know, the worst possible time during the day, you know, probably like 11 a.m. or something like that. Uh, so I didn't even think to bring my camera with me. Uh, but I saw this and I really love the strong shadows uh, from that strong overhead light of midday light. Um, and so, you know, there's a photography rule number, you know, 27 or something like that that says don't shoot uh, photos between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. because the light's too strong. And, and I say buoy to that. Uh, you can take photos whenever you see them. Uh, so I really like the angles of this. And I put this one right after the lighthouse one because it had uh, the lifeguard stand one because it has a lot of similar elements with diagonal lines. And, you know, I tried to space things out. So I have kind of different quadrants that were each kind of similar amount of area. Um, and I saw it and you know, I, I was kind of bummed I didn't have my camera, my real camera with me. So I just took an iPhone shot for reference. Uh, and I said, you know, maybe I'll come back, you know, some other day while we're on this trip to take this photo. And I went back several times during that trip around the same time of day and with my real camera and tripod, I was all geeked out. And I just did not find the same situation. The light was just slightly different. The shadows weren't quite the same. And even though I had the, the copy on my phone for reference for composition, I could get the same composition, but I couldn't get the same lighting. And so the kind of lesson learned here is take the photo when you see it. Uh, so in this case, it's an iPhone shot, shot with like an iPhone 5 or 4 or something like that. So I can't blow it up to big resolution. So it'll never be sold to a billboard company or something like that. But it's still a great photo and can still have some use. So uh, don't get discouraged if you don't always have the right equipment with you to shoot with what you got. Uh, this is at the National Gallery of Art uh, in D.C., uh, so this beautiful stonework uh, there and just tilting my camera at a weird angle and kind of looking up towards the ceiling, uh, create some interesting angles here and lights and shadows. So again, I'm just trying to create something out of something different, right? That beautiful stonework. Uh, and I'm trying to showcase that stonework, but showcase it in a different way and show uh, just kind of angles and shapes and shades of gray. Um, with this photo. Does anybody know what this one is? Pause, give you a moment to guess. Beer. Jukebox. Beer is close. So this is, this is Coca-Cola. So you can see the red can, <laughs> the red, the red can there. Um, so I was drinking a soda one day, a can of soda, and I set my can down, I guess, a little too hard on the table and a bunch of the soda, it must have been a full can, and a bunch of the soda splashed up onto the lip. Uh, and the lip is, you know, it's machined and so it's got this kind of striations in it. And it was, you know, very fizzy, so it created these bubbles. I was like, wow, that's, that's really pretty. I could do something interesting with that with my macro lip. Uh, so I spent the day shaking up cans of soda and splashing them up on onto the lid of the soda can and made a big old mess all over my kitchen floor uh, and just some window light my macro lens uh, just tried a bunch of different compositions uh, until I got something uh, that I liked so I thought this was a nice play of colors with the bubbles and then we had the lines uh, from the coke can the curves to kind of offset the circle spheres of the bubbles so just combining a lot of different elements uh, to create something interesting so then after, after that day, uh, later I said, well, what else is in my, you know, just in my house I can take interesting photos of. And so uh, this is a hard boiled egg slicer. Um, so I just kind of position it. And this was uh, taken one winter, we were snowed in, this one of the bigger snowstorms. And um, so just with my iPhone, I just got a piece of white paper and I did a whole series called what's in my kitchen. And just close-up shots, a little uh, macro adapter called an Ollie clip, I think it was, a little macro adapter lens that slides onto my uh, smartphone. And just took a whole series of just kitchen gadgets and things I found in my kitchen drawers that I thought would make interesting abstracts uh, with lines and shapes. And, you know, I could have gotten out my macro lens and set up my tripod and bring out the studio lights and diffusers and all these 
things and spent hours setting up um, the composition. But I really wanted to just challenge myself to focus on scene and not focus on the technology. And I felt if I got out all my big boy gear and set up all that stuff, it would be too much of a, an exercise. And I would lose, lose some of the spontaneity of just looking and creating. And so I think that's one of the things I wanna share with some of these photos you'll see in here is that not every photo you take needs to be your competition winning photos. Sometimes you just take photos just, to, just for the joy of it. Sometimes it's just to practice your creativity, practice seeing, practice your composition. Not every photo has to be you know, 45 megapixel, uh, like my D850 I have now um, camera. You know, sometimes just play with your phone or play with a little toy camera, whatever you have, uh, just to keep it simple. So then, so that was really inspired by like, wow, there's, there's macro stuff all over the place that I can find. Uh, so one day, so I'm an engineer, as I mentioned, and I tend to dress up a little nicer than maybe the average engineer. Um, and one day I was, I was at work and I was sitting on the toilet and uh, I was looking down at my, my dress slacks and I was like, wow, there's a lot of interesting you know, tailoring uh, in here with the different kind of fabrics that they overlay um, on the kind of the inside and the pockets. And so I was really inspired uh, to take this kind of series. And again, you know, this is not a photo that I would enter into competition, right? Um, but it's, it's about training my eye to see creatively. And so I was really inspired that day. And so that, that weekend, I pulled out all my dress slacks, all my fancy pants, and I just scattered them on the floor with a little window light, my macro lens, uh, and did a whole series of just stuff like this, geometric shapes, kind of focusing on some of the stitching and details. Uh, I posted on Facebook with the title, Inside My Pants. And, and that got uh, quite a lot of reactions uh, from my people. They were really a little curious as to what the heck I was talking about um, until they saw the photos. So this is just one, uh, one example from that. Um, this interesting rock, uh, just a lot of interesting colors in it. And I like the, the shapes. And there's, there's a story behind this one too. And this one, I was in West Virginia. I was actually on a workshop. Uh, we we're doing fall colors and we had some scenic vista and the fall colors just weren't speaking to me. And you know, the other photographers on this workshop, they were clicking away and they were having a grand old time. And I just, I wasn't inspired for whatever reason. It was a beautiful vista. The colors were gorgeous. You know, I took a few shots, but I just wasn't feeling it that at that moment. Uh, so I said, well, I need to be true to myself. Uh, Sandy mentioned an artist first, right? true to my art. And so if I'm not inspired by whatever everyone else is taking photos of, find something different to take photos of. And so I'm looking around, I look down at my feet, and we're standing on this very interesting rock, uh, this big boulder that had these different colors on it and different shapes. And I've oversaturated this a little bit in post-processing to kind of bring out some of those colors. But I really just like the play of the geometry and the, the jaggedness, kind of used a little bit of a rule of thirds and how I lined it up. And so you know, the workshop instructor came by and of course everyone's cameras are facing forward into this ravine and taking pictures of all these this river and these and the trees they're like greg why is your camera pointed at your feet and i showed on the back of my my camera I'm like oh wow i didn't see that and it's those moments that i just really feel really vindicated like i've saw, seen something that someone else didn't see and someone else appreciated what i saw because uh, not everyone is going to like these uh, abstract things so again, another lesson shared here is if you're somewhere and you're not inspired, it doesn't matter if the 10 photographers next to you are inspired. If you're not inspired, go find something that does inspire you. You don't have to conform with the other people. Even if you spent thousands of dollars to go on this workshop, uh, if you're not inspired at that moment, find some other way to be inspired. So this one, uh, this was the lead-in image on the title page, and I'll show you a couple of these. Um, so this one was interesting. I'd seen this, and I was just—I saw it, and I was wow, I was amazed. And does anyone know what this is? Or can guess what it is? Barn Ford. Close. We'll go with that. We'll go with that for now, and I'll show you what it is. So, yeah, it is a type of wood, 
and it just had these interesting staining patterns on it. And so I took a couple quick shots with my iPhone and kind of made a mental note, like I gotta go back to this, um, to this subject uh, when I can bring back my camera and uh, you know maybe go in a better lighting situation. So I took this photo and again, it's, you can tell it's some type of wood, uh, but it's not really about the wood. It's about the shapes, the, the colors, the graduation from grays to orange, uh, just the kind of amoeba looking, natural looking shapes. Um, here's another picture of that same object. Uh, obviously, you know, totally different than, than this one, um, processed slightly differently as well. Um, so showing some repetition with the lines and the circles, but still appreciating that, that blue gray color combined with the orange. So this is what I've seen. Uh, so again, back to uh, Chicoteak Island where my family used to vacation all the time. And this was the shed door of the Putt-Putt Golf Place on Main Street. And so they had had the door open and it's just a piece of cheap plywood that had been there a long time and, and gotten these water stains on it. And I was just really inspired by this, this organic shapes I was seeing. And so I came back later with my tripod and my camera and you know, asked the you know, teenage girl working the summer, her summer job there. I said, hey, can I come in? I don't wanna play golf. I wanna take some pictures of your, of your, shed, your shed there. It looks like the door's still open. And she's, she's like, what? I was like, yeah, the shed, it's got some cool you know, colors on it. And she just kind of shook her head, but she saw I had a professional looking camera, I guess. So she's like, whatever, go in there. Um, so yeah, I spent, you know, 15 minutes or whatever, taking a bunch of different photos. Uh, so I just share two with two, two with you there, but I probably took several dozen different compositions, wide, tight, stuff like that. So again, just to show that these abstracts, these things can be seen anywhere. You just got to train your eye to be on the lookout, even when you're playing putt-putt with your family, uh, to be on the lookout for interesting things. Um, so this one, I'll show you the, the color, which is what I originally photographed um, and I liked. And I also done the black and white. Um, so two different feels um, to the photo. You know, clearly a close up of, of some type of flower. Um, but, you know, focusing on the shapes and the, and the petals, and I like the graduation of color uh, in the black and white or in the, in the color one. Um, and then the black and white emphasize a little bit differently, going more of a high low key, high contrast to emphasize those little white frilly things. So to me, you might call this a close up. I still put it in the family of abstract because it's not really about the plant. Um, it's about the shapes and, uh, and the lines. And so this is what it looked like. This is up at um, Rawlings Conservatory in Baltimore. Um, so it's just a little tiny plant. Uh, you see it's a white paintbrush. Um, and it's just small, you know, about the size of a dinner plate. And I just like the overlapping of all the petals. And so just spent some time with my, my close-up lens on a tripod to just try to find a pleasing um, composition that worked. And I like that S curve kind of going through the middle of the frame. Uh, this is also at Rawlings Concern. This is one of those big, uh, I think they'd call like banana, banana leaf trees, big uh, leaves that are like, you know, four or five feet long. And so the photo on the left was the first photo I took and just kind of playing between the difference of the, you know, kind of compositional elements with a curvy S line and then a straight line and the juxtaposition of those two, sort of using a rule of thirds, uh, but not necessarily exactly. Um, but the color one wasn't work quite working out for me. Um, I wasn't quite sure what, what to do with it. So I had one of my old cameras converted to infrared, sent off to Life Pixel. Um, the 720 nanometer, uh, just regular infrared um, spectrum. And so you can see with infrared, it not only does it do some kind of wacky colors and then you kind of just play with your white balance till you get something interesting, uh, but you can see how it really softens it, right? It softens those lines quite a bit. And I really liked the softening that it did because it allowed me to really focus on that, that vertical line and the soft, gentle curve uh, there on the right of the screen. Then you're not distracted by all the vines and all the little dots of, of the leaf. And so it's just a more simplified uh, image. So, you know, sometimes it's about the processing that you do to get your final image, or in this case, the camera uh, with a different, seeing a different spectrum. 
So then, you know, years later, I'm in Chicago and I'm taking uh, one of those architectural boat tours. If you ever get a chance to go to Chicago, highly recommend them. They're really cool. They give you a lot of interesting background on the buildings. Um, I've long since forgotten which building this is along the river or which the architect was and why it was so famous. Uh, but I like the curves and the lighting on the building. And again, I'm not there at the most optimal time of day. I'm with my family and, you know, we're at like the 1030 boat tour or something. Um, so light's pretty strong. Uh, but in the shadow side of this building, um, I started to see those curves and straight lines and it reminded me a lot of this, these pictures that I'd taken years later. And so sometimes pictures we take maybe aren't uh, going to be our award-winning or, or favorite picture, but they lead us uh, in our development of seeing creatively to maybe a picture that we can appreciate even more. Um, and I had this picture printed out and uh, hung up on my house, uh, hung up in my house. Um, right. Um, so I like taking pictures of cars. I'm not a car person. I've long since forgotten uh, which car this is, but this is at the Rockville um, annual car show. Uh, I think it's every like second weekend in September or October or something like that, sometime in the early fall. Um, it's pretty much one of the biggest car shows on the Eastern coast or something like that. Um, but I used to go every year and just do close up detailed shots. Uh, so this is some beautifully restored car. Um, and I call this one Art Deco because it has that wonderful blue color with the chrome, uh, but I'm just focusing in on lines and shapes uh, with angles. I got straight lines. Uh, if you look really closely, you can see me in the little circular uh, doodad there on the, the chrome fender um, squatted down on the ground taking this detail. But it's not only the pretty, beautiful cars uh, that you can create abstracts from. Uh, I like going to junkyards or band, finding abandoned cars. Uh, so here's a case of blue car. It's just been long since faded its paint job and has all these uh, little uh, pine needles uh, resting in the, the edge there of the, the trunk. So again, uh, I'm kind of copying some of my earlier work with intersections of curves and, and straight lines and the color of blue, uh, but obviously a very different photo but still kind of an abstract where I, um, it's focused more on the lines uh, than it is on what the object is. And then of course you can take this to, this is a more minimalistic type photo, but you can take it to the extreme and just really focus in on a grill of a truck uh, that's been worn by many years of age sitting outside. So again, some people might say this is more of a close up. You can tell it's a some type of metal grill of a tractor or, or a car or something like that. Um, but again, the focus for me is the lines, the intersection, uh, the colors, you know, definitely play into it and the patina of, of the metal, um, definitely, you know, key elements of the frame, uh, but it's more about the lines and the shapes. Um, clouds, this is taken here in Colorado. Um, I just, I like this intersection. You'll see this a lot in my work uh, where I do, um, sort of a one-third, two-third, a lot of times ratio, but intersection of different textures. So in this case, we have the kind of uh, bubbly little you know, textured clouds on the top, and then a nice smooth bank of clouds on the bottom and conveniently separated by a, a thin little line, curvy line going through there. So we're starting to see, I'm developing some type of patterns, right? Some type of uh, Greg uh, vision, you know, common vision or style. Uh, obviously some similar elements here to the infrared, um, you know, banana tree leaf we saw in the building and stuff, some similar kind of elements. Uh, we could take this, you know, the opposite way with very dark. Uh, this is again, the thing take with my infrared camera, which really darkens in those clouds. Um, so it's not really a picture of clouds, you know, don't really have anything in the foreground to give you scale or anything. Uh, to me, it's just about the shades of gray. Um, just intersection of things, the pop of light, we have some lines, diagonal lines coming through here, and then just the gradiated um, gray to, to dark black. So I took a whole, I've taken lots of these photos, uh, lots of series. Um, who was it? Alfred Stieglitz uh, from the early 1900s. Uh, he did a whole series of these kinds of things, called them equivalents. And he said that uh, it was a way to express your inner psyche 
uh, in these cloud formations. So maybe if you study these long enough, you'll see into my head or something like that. Um, so what he did, Stieglitz did, is he did them in uh, triptic, tri 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 triptics, groups of three. Um, so I did a little group of three, and this is actually just my, with my iPhone, uh, taken with uh, an app I called uh, Hipstamatic. It has some really good black and white film simulators, uh, but it's a square format. Um, so again, not high resolution photos, uh, but they're still fun to do, just fun to just keep my creative juices flowing. There's that juicing word again, uh, Sandy. Uh, I guess that's one of my common phrases, juice, juice it up or juice, keep my juices flowing. Um, this is in Baltimore, Fells Point area. I was uh, leading a workshop back when I taught for Capital Photography. Um, so sunrise coming up and so creating some wonderful orange light on, on the water there and a lot of boats going by, so creating all these great ripples. And so just the interplay of, of the darks and the lights and the, the pops of gold. Um, and you'll notice throughout this presentation that I share where these locations are, not uh, really for the reason to show you that these things are really everywhere, right? You can see this stuff all over the place. You don't have to go to any exotic place uh, to find interesting abstracts or interesting photos. I mean, these are all places real close to all you guys, um, and especially Baltimore Camera Club here, right here in uh, Phil's Point. Uh, this is back to Chicago. Um, so I was headed to that uh, architectural boat tour. It's just, you know, 1030 in the morning. And there were some really cool reflections in the water. Uh, there was some, there was like this big tan building. That's the one on the right. Uh, the one on the left, there's some sort of orange like footbridge going across the river at one point. And there's some other building reflected. And it, this is, you know, these conditions might not happen every day. Um, it's just the, you get the light at the right angle and the ripples at the right time and the reflection is just right. And you can create these interesting patterns. A lot of people will do this at boat yards. Um, you get some similar kinds of things with boats, with the ropes and stuff like that and the masts of the sailing ships. Um, so I really like these. These I kind of mind of like amoebas, uh, very again, natural, kind of like the wood uh, we saw in the shed earlier. So these are a couple of the photos. These are uh, just lightly processed. Let me show you one of the more final results. Um, so I like these two, but you know, I kept playing with it. Took a whole bunch of whole bunch of photos. My you know family is saying, "Greg, what are you taking photos of? We gotta catch the boat." And I'm like, "Oh, just give me a minute. Just give me a minute." Um, so I'm taking these as fast as I can before I head out with my family. So I settled on this one. I liked uh, this is straight out of the camera. This is unedited. Uh, so it's straight out of the camera, and this I liked the the look of this one and I immediately was thinking that amoeba but being an engineer i do a lot with electronics and i'm used to seeing circuit boards which are those uh bright green circuit boards with all the electronics soldered on top so that's the kind of vision i had in my mind it's like somehow merging circuit boards with amoebas or some sort of organic matter so i saw this and this is one i settled on but um it, it wasn't right. And so much like the lifeguard stand we saw at the beginning of the presentation, um, I said, I need to isolate down. Uh, now, in this case, I didn't have a lot of time when I took these photos. So I just took a couple of photos, some tight, some wide, and I had skedaddle because uh, my family was waiting for me. Uh, but on a normal day, if I was by myself, I would have done a lot more cropping in camera uh, versus in post. But anyway, uh, so this is the image I settled on. So then my first edit, like I said, I was staking circuit boards. And so I was uh, playing with the color channels and the saturation vibrant sliders in Lightroom uh, to get kind of the color I wanted. Um, and I guess I cropped this a little differently. I cropped out that little blue, looks like a little baby um, in, a, in a womb there in the lower left. I cropped that out. And I thought this you know, kind of brought in more uniform of the squiggles that I was looking for. Um, kind of was getting close to the color I wanted, but it still wasn't there. Sorry, is there a question? No, no, um, no it's um, I've got to mute somebody, so. Okay, okay, yeah. thanks, Sandy. Um, so I was almost there. And so a lot of times when I find I'm stuck on a photo and I can't quite get the crop that I want, that's when I start looking at alternate crops, like going to square or four by five or panoramic. So this is the final image uh, that I ended up with. And bringing back the uh, 
uh, amoeba baby there in the lower left corner. Uh, clearly, I played with the, the colors a lot more than the, the original image. But this is where these abstracts, like we've seen in the beginning of the presentation, a lot of them were found, and I just take the photo. Uh, this one was a little bit partially found, partially created. Uh, so a lot of work on this one to get the final look that I wanted. Um, and then I, I debate with myself a lot about the little blue blob in the lower left, but I find it so interesting. And like I said, it reminds me of like a baby in a womb. Um, maybe I'm yearning to have another kid. I don't know. I'm almost 50. It's probably not a good idea. Um, <laughs> but uh, it kind of played with this kind of amoeba theme that I had going uh, on in my head. Um, I like taking, looking at beaches, uh, taking uh, close-up details at beaches. Uh, this is at Black Sands, or not Black Sands, um, Black Beach in San Diego. I learned years later that apparently that's a nudist beach or something like that, but there was none of that when I was there. Um, I was there early one morning, and again, this is a business trip. Uh, I used to do a lot of uh, inspections uh, for as a quality engineer, and so they'd fly me out to these uh, different vendors. Uh, and a lot of times, due to the way the, the timing of the flights worked, I'd end up having to stay overnight uh, when, when my inspection only took half a day. So I just take a couple of days leave for the second half and bring my camera with me and you know, go find some place to photograph. Um, so in this case, I looked up on Google Maps and said, oh, there's a little beach nearby. Let me see what I can find there. Um, so I went, I think, early one morning, uh, the next morning for my flight. And I'm just... Uh, I have my tripod set up, looking straight down at the beach and just looking for interesting um, compositions. And so the one on the top, uh, similar compositions to the cloud picture. We saw the blue cloud picture we saw before, but flipped, uh, where the texture stuff is at the bottom third and then the smooth area is at the top. So again, starting to see some, some trends uh, with some of my photography. Uh, and then on the bottom, it's just the, this, I guess it had rained or something like that and created a little drip drops uh, on, on the sand and just the way the salt had left behind, left this kind of white residue. So it's interesting, I, I'm, I'm standing on this beach, I have my tripod set up, I'm looking down, and out of the corner of my eye, I'm seeing people, you know, beach walkers go by and I could see every once in a while they turn and look at me and you know, probably think, oh, is there a, a shark watch, washed up on shore? Is it a jellyfish, a starfish? You know, what is he photographing? And I could see a few of them kind of shake their heads, like, what is this guy taking a picture of the sand for? And But no one came up and asked me what I was doing. Maybe they're too scared. Um, but maybe, you know, had they come up and asked and seen what I was taking photos of, maybe they would have been inspired. Uh, so here's a couple more beach scenes uh, from some other location. I have a whole, I could do a whole presentation just on patterns in the sand. Um, so here on the left, a little, squiggly line, kind of like my um, green leaf thing we saw before. And I love these ones on the right where it's like explosion, right? Like I have some type of element and then I get the lines radiating out from it. And these could, uh, you could probably also, uh, back to the equivalence um, idea, you could also think of these as those uh, ink blot things, the Rorschach, Rorschach, and never pronounce his name correctly, uh, the, the psychiatrist. Uh, with the ink blots, and you could get some idea into my soul or something of what I see of these things. Um, so anyway, but that's a lecture for another day. Um, so sometimes with the beach stuff, I'll try to include some type of element, uh, some interesting seashell or a piece of seaweed, in this case a rock. Uh, so in this case, this rock had been on the beach, and the, when the waves crashed over it um, and receded, they left these radiating lines behind it. So really added some interesting drama um, to the photo. Uh, again, back to our, our clouds with the ripples versus the smooth. In this case, a wonderful little S line. Um, this is probably Shinkatik again. That's where I do a lot, did a lot of my beach photo. Uh, and this is just the top of a sand dune. So the, the wind coming off the water uh, and the waves created the little ripply pattern on the side, and then the winds coming off the bay side. Uh, created just more of a smooth, a smooth sanded pattern uh, on the left side of the sand dune. Anybody know what this one is? Or can take a guess.
No guesses? So this one, I saw this one and I immediately thought of Van Gogh. Uh, he did a lot with, you know, kind of wiggly lines and then the similar kind of color. I think he has a self-portrait uh, that has the same kind of color palette. This is taken in Great Falls on the Potomac River and this is, or off the Potomac River, this is pond scum. So uh, this is like an algae that grows on top of a stagnant lake or, or body of water. Uh, and this is taken along the canal. They just had some stagnant water there. And so this algae had started to grow. And then from the winds, it just had kind of blown it all to one corner of the pond and in turn also created these ripply patterns as well as a nice gradient of how it mushed the colors together. So it smelled really rank, uh, but you know, I, I saw something beautiful in it. And so I'm taking my, you know, got my tripod out, taking some photos. And some other kids came by and they had their cameras. They'd been taking pictures of the, the waterfall or whatever. And like, what are you doing? And of course they come over like, oh my gosh, it stinks. The high heavens over there. And I'm like, oh, I'm taking pictures of the pond scum. They're like, what? I was like, yeah, that algae, pond scum, whatever, the algae on the water. And they're like, really? Like, what? And then I showed them back at the camera like, oh, ooh. And then of course they, they you know, get their cameras and trying to t you take similar pictures. And so again, it's the, you just gotta look and sometimes look beyond the smell, look beyond the subject and see the beauty that's, that's maybe not as obvious to the passerby. So then after I'd taken that photo, of course, now that photo is ingrained in my head. So now I'm always on the lookout for that same kind of thing, along with the cloud photos we showed before. Uh, so here's just a couple examples where I'm taking a, 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 a topic, but kind of a composition and then applying it to other genre. And so here on the top is some sort of rock face I saw somewhere that reminded me of that, that pond scum image. Uh, and then there on the bottom, duckweed on a pond and uh, some duck probably had, had swam through it and created the little patterns. Uh, and then just, you know, playing with the saturation. Um, so maybe it's not immediately obvious exactly what it is um, because it's just more about the colors and kind of play of the lines and the colors together. Um, any guesses on what this one is? So this reminded me of Monet's paintings, like his water lilies. Um, so this one's taken down in Georgia, and this is at Old Car City. Uh, it's a wonderful, if you like rusty old cars, or just old cars, um, Old Car City outside, uh, just north of Atlanta, Georgia, um, this former junkyard slash car lot, uh, something like 3,000 cars, American cars, uh, just scattered in the woods. Uh, and so these ones had just grown this different kind of lichen or moss uh, growing on them. And, you know, normally, you know, most people pass by and say, well, oh gosh, that's a horrible photo. It's got a pile, car piled on top of it. It's all covered in this yuck. Like it's not, I can't appreciate it as a car, but you know, I'm not there necessarily to say, take pictures of the cars. I'm there to see what I can do with the lines or colors of the you know, faded, faded colors of the car. Uh, to create something unique. And so again, with that idea of Monet's water lilies in my head uh, with a blue background and then the little pops of color, um, these are the two, two of the compositions I came out with. Um, this is also another car um, at the old car city. Um, so in this case, uh, again, much like the uh, Chicago River, uh, a lot of playing in in Lightroom uh, to play with the colors, but you can see it's just some some um, pollen or dust that had built up on this car and then rain had trickled down and kind of washed some of it off. But I like the little lines kind of look like tunnels of an animal or something like that, um, but uh, uh, very abstract. And, but these, sorry, this is one of the, so this colors with this like blackish gray with the yellow, I didn't really like the colors. Um, but you know, that's where the fun begins in Lightroom, where you can play with the color chips. Is there a question? Um, yes, well, actually somebody put in the chat room and I just wanted to sort of reiterate what she's saying. 
She loves anything rusty and colors are amazing and textures too. So feedback for you. So she's enjoying it. That's okay. Carol. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Well, thanks. Thanks for the feedback. I'm glad, glad you're in, uh, liking this stuff. All right, so it's a couple more rusty cars, and then we'll move on to another subject matter. So I like this one. It's kind of like the flames of the uh, eternal hell or something like that, uh, burning up against the, some type of blue sky, and just a rusty car door, um, some blue car, I guess, and then just been faded. Um, this is, again, at another junkyard. And, and these junkyards, um, this one is actually up by my in-laws. And I've been driving past this junkyard for years and years. And it had, looked like it had some really old cars and vines and stuff growing over them. And, but I'm kind of a shy person. I, I don't, it's, it's very interesting. At my job, I have to be very outgoing. I'm a project leader. Um, but when I'm doing with my photography, it's, to me, it's a little bit more of a solo event. Um, and sometimes I can be a little timid. And so I've been passing by this junkyard for years, driving up to my in-laws. And then one time I was like, you know, I really got to stop and take pictures of a couple of these cars along, along the side of the road there. And so I uh, dropped my family off at my in-laws. I double back um, to this park along the side of the road. I'm just taking a couple of pictures of the, the cars that are right along the side of the road. And the owner uh, had a house on the property, comes out, is like, hey, Sonny, you know, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just taking you know pictures of your some of the cool old cars here. He's like, oh, okay. And and he's like, yo, you can you can come on the property. You don't have to park on the road there. And I was like, really? I can I can come back sometimes. Like, sure, come back. Just knock on the door. Let me know you're there, so I can open the gate for you. And so I did. So I came back and I spent the whole day just wandering around this junkyard. Um, and so this one, you can see what this is, uh, some sort of panel truck. Um, probably been painted many colors over the years as is owned by different people. Um, and I just like that uh, mix of the colors with the green and the blue. Um, so originally I took some wider shots like this. This one's unprocessed, but the wider shots with the door handle. Uh, but then I decided that I liked without the door handle and just the mix of colors and the little cracks, like cracked mud or something like that, um, mixing between the two. Uh, this one, I won't make you guess on this one, but this one's back to Old Car City in Georgia. Um, so this was this rusty truck. And so it had all kinds of rust and color to it. There was all kinds of dirt and debris and stuff on the window. And so this is, you know, something I just need to stop and study, right? Stop and look, look for my close-ups, you know, kind of I'll, I'll make a little circle with my fingers and kind of isolate my eyes. And this was some type of oil or residue, something on the inside of the glass that had leaked on there or something like that, and then kind of frozen in place and create this interesting little bubble, look like a brain or something. Um, but I love this, the, the mix of the yellows with the white, um, interesting little patterns. And so you can see there on the right, this is only like this, not even the size of my palm of my hand. Uh, so just a very small area. Uh, so with my macro lens uh, up really close on this. Um, but these kinds of things, most people would never see unless you stop and look and go really close in on, on some of these things to find um, these interesting compositions. All right, enough with the rusty uh, cars, uh, as much as I could uh, do a whole presentation on those as well. Um, so sunflower fields in Maryland, where I used to live, um, well, you all live there too, uh, the, uh, in Poolsville. Uh, there in uh, out by Seneca uh, in the southwest, right along the Potomac, there's that big sunflower field. And so all the photographers go there, and it's really kind of gotten overrun, unfortunately. Uh, but after many years of going there, I was like, okay, I, I still am really inspired, so I'll still go back, um, but I want to do something different. Like, what else can I do? I've done the, the big, wide HDR shots of the field, I've done, you know, isolated a single sunflower. So one year I went there just with my macro lens and just doing close up stuff just trying to see if I can come up with different compositions. So it's not like a broken record, but you're starting to see this pattern emerge of the texture uh, mixing with the smooth lines, the kind of one third, two third composition. Um, so just mixing those two together. And so this is one of these sunflowers that hadn't fully opened yet. So half of it had opened. I actually did a whole series of these, uh, I call them like alien sunflowers. These ones that are partially opened um, that create something interesting. But then I isolated 
um, and went in close to just show that juxtaposition of the texture versus the lines. And then, then I just did some just plain, just a wash of color uh, with the lines and the subtle gradations uh, with the shadows of just a bunch of leaves uh, stacked on top of each other. Did a little bit of a softer focus, so it all kinds of just blends together and it's not uh, hyper detail. Um, in Maryland, uh, was it Brook, Brookside Gardens? Yeah, Brookside Gardens, uh, plants are tulips every year uh, there in Wheaton, Maryland. And uh, used to go there, photograph the tulips every spring. And then I said, well, what else can I do? You know, I've done the tulips, uh, what else can I come up with? And so I'd read this uh, book by oh, someone out of Jersey, Diane Sandbridge or something like that. Anyway, um, and she had done this whole thing about soft focus, like a wide open on your lens, like F2.8, um, and just showing these like little bits of curve to a flower. Uh, so that's why I went there and I was, well, I was kind of inspired to do that day. So these are um, just some white tulips and just doing little detailed close-up shots, wide open. So just very, very soft focus and just little tiny bits of sharpness. Um, my favorites, besides I'm not a big flower person, I love the desert. Um, I love aloes. And so this is at, I think my in-laws house. They have a bunch of aloe plants uh different agave and aloes and stuff like that and this is one where the when the leaves lay against each other uh they'll kind of create like a stain uh on it and then when the leaf dies or whatever comes off it leaves these kind of shadows behind for a while so this is just the intersection of all these different lines and stuff uh you can tell it's some type of plant or some type of organic uh but that's again not really the point it's really just about the, the shades of gray and the, just the interesting patterns. You know, just something for you to study and have your eyes kind of wander around the image. Um, some palm, some type of palm tree, well, somewhere tropical, very bright day, some really bright light on it. Uh, but I kind of like the little white streaks it added. Um, again, this, this photo, I'm not gonna submit this to a competition. It's not gonna end up on the cover of some magazine or my portfolio or something like that. Uh, but it's kind of interesting, uh, the lines and the shapes, and again, just training my eyes to see things uh, differently. This is a fun technique, they call this in-camera movement, uh, where you do a slightly longer uh, shutter speed, like maybe a tenth of a second, half of a second, and you wiggle your camera, or in this case, wiggle and swipe up and down. Uh, so this is some like, um, I think these might have been tulips or something, just the, the green leaves of the of a flower, uh, just all bunched together. And then this this wavy kind of technique. It's a lot of trial and error. You, know, you take dozens of these and maybe you get one that works out pretty good um, that has kind of the right balance of, of squiggles and the, the shades and stuff. But really fun to do. And it's all just done on camera. Uh, there's all kinds of filters in Photoshop. You can try to simulate this stuff, uh, but it's way more fun to just do it in person. Uh, this is also tulips. Uh, so this is a swipe technique. Again, I'm moving the camera with a slow start speed on, a, on an angle, um, wide open like f2.8 on my macro lens. And the macro too is also just throwing everything out of focus. So just a wash of color. And so this one, I took this one. I was really proud of this one. I thought this was a really interesting abstract, not immediately noticeable exactly what it is, although maybe study for a while, you figure it's some type of flower or something. Um, but I really like this one. And um, we had at one of my camera club meetings, we had uh, someone, uh, it was one of the judges for the, what is this, Joe, Joe something, he does this macro exhibit every year. I forget what it is, somewhere in Maryland. But anyway, uh, so it's one of the judges for that. And so, uh, or a former judge for that. And so I showed him this. And I said, what do you think of this one? He's like, oh, yeah, that's all right. I was like, all right. It's like one of my favorite abstracts I've done of late. It's like, yeah, it's not abstract enough. I was like, oh, I was thinking, oh, Joe Miller, that's what it's called. And I was like, oh, I was thinking to enter into the Joe Miller your annual uh, abstract uh, exhibit. He's like, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And so I didn't listen to him. I submitted it. And well, it wasn't selected. Uh, didn't get entered uh, into the exhibit. So I was kind of bummed. Uh, but, you know, that's just one person's opinion. And just because Joe Miller and, and his judges are do an annual uh, abstract exhibit doesn't mean they're, they're the foremost authority on abstracts. Um, but I still like the image. 
And so a year or two later, um, I submitted this to Nature Visions, uh, which is obviously a much, much bigger uh, venue. Um, at the time, I think they've done away with it. Now, of course, they've changed the name of Nature Visions. It used to be Nature Vi Northern Virginia Photographic Expo, and then it was Nature Visions. Now it has, like, it has a different name. But anyway, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, all these different camera clubs submit images. And so I submitted this one into the abstract category. And not only was it selected, but it won first place. So best out of you know the hundred photos they had on exhibit and probably several hundred that they had entered uh, into that category. So it just goes to show, if you like a photo, if you're interested in it, you know, keep, keep doing something with it, keep exhibiting it or keep trying to uh, enter into compositions because one person's opinion doesn't mean that's everyone's opinion, especially with abstracts, because not everyone's cup of tea and not everyone's gonna like the same abstracts. Uh, back to some more in-camera movements. This is one where uh, instead of kind of an up and down movement, I'm twirling my camera, actually twisting it, kind of keeping one arm mostly steady and then moving the other one in an arch um, uh, formation. So there's some yellow flowers here in the foreground and there's these little red vines or something like that. Uh, I think this is back to Brookside Gardens again. Um, so again, just fun to play with, you know, just washes of color and lines, a little psychedelic of sorts, I guess. Uh, this is back to acetique, so sunrise. Um, and so I've, I've mounted my camera, uh, leveled it out, and I'm just panning uh, with the camera over maybe a second or two exposure. Um, and so since I've leveled the camera, the lines get really straight. And so that blue in the foreground is the ocean and the white is the waves crashing onto the shore. And then the orange, of course, is the sunrise and then a little bit of clouds there. And so this image has actually done really well for me. I've exhibited this a couple of times and actually a couple of people bought copies of this uh, for me. Um, but again, this is a somewhat trial and error. You know, I do a whole bunch of these and it all depends on how fast you pivot the camera with what shutter speed you selected and exactly how the waves are crashing because you don't want to get too many shadows um, from those dark lines. You want to get that right balance. So it's a lot of trial and error. And again, I probably took dozens of these uh, before the light uh, ch changed. Was there a question? What's, yeah, what's the shutter speed in this one? Uh, it's probably about like two seconds, I'd say. One to two seconds. Yeah, the, the shutter speed, it's um, for these kinds of things, it's really hard to say a specific shutter speed. Um, I, could, I can look it up at the end of the presentation, but the shutter speed, it's directly related also to how fast you're moving the camera. So you could have two people standing side by side with the same shutter speed, and depending on how fast they pivot the camera, they would get totally different results. So you really just kind of have to be, try a shutter speed. I'll usually start with like half a second, so I'll usually go to manual exposure. Um, in this case, there's a lot of light being sunrise. So probably with the like F16 or something like that, uh, half a second, a low ISO to keep my shutter speed long, uh, the half second, and then just pan the camera. And the idea is to kind of figure out how fast you're gonna move the camera and then just keep changing the shutter speed till you get the look you want. But yeah, anywhere from a half a second to maybe two seconds um, is, is use seems to work, depending on how fast you're moving the camera. Uh, so back to another swiping technique. Uh, this is some trees in winter. Um, weren't very interesting. Uh, sky was very bland that day, uh, but just doing this kind of swiping pattern um, just creates something interesting. And there's this one adage that says, when's the best time to take a portrait orientation photo? Uh, well, right after you've taken a landscape orientation photo. Uh, so. Uh, always remember to flip your camera and try different compositions. Um, and I actually like the vertical one better. Uh, I think it has just a different feel. I think the previous one, I left a little bit of color in there. You can see a little bit of orange and blues there at the bottom. Uh, and then the vertical one, I just did a straight black and white. So, you know, this is something I envision printing very big and being on like a wall of a, of a hotel or something like that to just kind of you know, take up a large space of wall, nondescript photo, uh, no royalties needed uh, for model releases or anything, uh, but just, you know, interesting, something interesting for people to look at as a passing by. Any ideas what this one is? 
This was one of my very first abstracts. This is really old. Give you a hint, you could all probably do this at your house. No takers. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got a guess. Okay. In the chat room, um, bubble ah. wrap, a cheese grater. Ah, cheese graters, uh, cheese grater is correct. Yes, so this is one of those oh. uh, box grate, a box grater actually. Uh, so it has a lot more surface area than a little small cheese grater. But yeah, a box, box grater. Uh, it was an older one we had in our house. And so it, it had been worn pretty good. It had some good kind of shine to the edges. And I'm just, I'd set it down with some window light and I'm just swiping my camera by it. Um, I wasn't precise in my swiping. That's why we got some squiggly lines there on the right. And then just playing with the white balance uh, in post-processing to make it, make it gold. I just amped the white balance real high up to sunshine or something like that uh, to give it that gold color. But again, um, it's, it's an abstract, but I'm still trying to make sure I have a good blend of the left side of the photo where we see kind of the shape a little bit, and then to the right side where it kind of trails off into these little wiggles um, and just playing with different different variations until I get a pleasing composition. And but good job on the guesses. Oh, Greg, we just got a, a, a comment a little bit earlier, but it relates. And someone said, I never thought of doing ICM with a macro lens. I'm looking forward to trying it. Ah, so you've inspired right. somebody. Right, yeah, because uh, yeah, mo most people are doing, uh, you're doing it with a big standard lens, you have big objects. So yeah, this is just with my macro lens. Uh, I have a 105 millimeter for my Nikon. So good, well, I'm glad I inspired someone to try something new. And you know, with winter coming up, and you're, you're stuck inside because it's snowy or, or dreary out, you know, these are the things you can do right in your house. Uh, so I, like I mentioned before, I do a lot of flying for work or at times, I guess. Um, so this is just a plain window. And I have an app on my smartphone called Slow Shutter, and I can set it to like a quarter of a second. So this is during takeoff. Uh, I was taking, a, I guess, a morning flight. So maybe a little bit of sunrise coming up there. And it would have been raining out. And so the water's kind of running down the side of the plane across the window. And so the slow shutter just blurs out um, everything going in the background. So kind of tricky to hold my camera steady um, so it doesn't get super blurry, um, but it's just the you know, rain streaking across the window. And then that, again, much like we saw in the very beginning with the lighthouse photo, that color gradient in the back just to add another element uh, to the lines and the little rain droplets. Um, looking down, right? We've, we've, we've looked up, we've looked in our kitchen, we've looked in our pants, um, but don't forget to look down. Um, yeah, <laughs> we look everywhere. Um, so this is uh, like a little oil or gas, gasoline streak uh, in a parking lot, um, in a parking lot. And I just thought it looked very like uh, stellar or outer worldly or something like that. And like some sort of Milky Way photo. Um, and so just playing with it in processing, uh, I think this is again, just shot with my smartphone. I have an app on my phone called Snapseed. It allows me to do some editing. I know some people, you can get like Lightroom now on your smartphones, but I don't know, I, I use Snapseed. And so just playing with the contrast to get it to look like a starry night um, and just that streak there. So I took that one and then I'm now I'm always on the lookout for where what's under my feet. You know, that's the name of my website, Images Underfoot. Um, so just the, the cracks in a cement sidewalk here on the left. On the right, uh, this is a white uh, paint strip of a, of a parking lot and it just was an old parking lot. So it was all cracked up. And so just, you know, play with the lines and the colors and it's, you know, the, the variations there. Not really a definitive subject uh, or point of focus. A lot of judges will say you must have a point of focus, something for your eyes to land on. Well, for abstracts, that's not always the case. Just allow your eyes to wander around the image. Uh, this is uh, some kid's basketball court. I just love the intersection of the crack with the kind of curved line there. Kind of remind me a little bit of my soda can photo we saw earlier. Again, there's those trends you start to see uh, peeking through my, my photography. 
Um, and this one, I, I tell a story about this one. So this one is taken in Hawaii. This is at the Pearl Harbor uh, exhibit on Oahu, uh, or memorial, I should say, not exhibit. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, if you haven't been there, uh, ever get a chance, it is really nice, very moving, uh, really well, tastefully done, a uh, great exhibit. Um, or well, it's exhibit slash memorial. Um, so it's both. But anyway, very moving. But I'm walking up to this exhibit and there on the sidewalk is this curved line. It's like someone dragged something along the line and left some metallic residue behind that subsequently rusted and created some different colors. And I amp this up in post-processing to get the colors I want. But the reason I tell the story is yet again to show that these abstracts can be anywhere. So even if you have this beautiful, you know, wonderful moving memorial, uh, Eyes on the lookout because you never know where something interesting might be. But I do have to pause here uh, with a brief message from my legal department. Uh, I've been talking about looking down and walking through parking lots and heavily trafficked um, tourist uh, tourist shops. And uh, so I want to make sure you're aware that you always should look out where you're walking, uh, especially when you're looking down and in a parking lot. Uh, there's a lot of hazards. Uh, so I don't want to take any responsibility. Uh, to hear from your lawyers uh, that you uh, got run over by car or you bumped your head because Greg told you in his presentation to look down at the ground uh, to get your abstract photos. So I just put that out there. Uh, be cautious and watch where you're going. All right, a couple more of the ground and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, so this is just some cracked mud, kind of like we saw with some of the rusty photos uh, before. And so this one, I did kind of create a little bit of a composition. This one, if you, if you kind of look at it, it's a little bit like a yin yang symbol with the kind of clear spot, circle spots on the left and the right, and then the wave kind of cutting through the middle with a little, little bit of a curve kind of nestling through there. Um, this one is ice uh, frozen in a little, like a little divot in a, in a rock or something like that. I was in Tennessee, Great Smoky Mountains for a winter workshop, and uh, I like just little tiny thing and this is with my macro lens so this little thing of ice probably the size of a little sandwich plate and but you have to look closely right you're not necessarily going to see it if you're just quickly going by and just i see like a little frozen pond with some texture in it, and i say hey maybe there's some a photo there and so again with my my macro lens getting really up close to isolate just i mean this picture probably represents the size of a quarter or a half dollar very small uh, little image, but with the macro lens, I'm able to get in there really tight, especially the 105 macro that I have. Um, so here's a uh, after and here's before. So this is on a road, and this is just this very fine ice, uh, very, very shallow puddle. So this is this ice that you like, you just barely touch it, and it shatters. It's very, very thin, but it had, had some wind or whatever um, when it froze and created this interesting texture. So just looking for something interesting uh, compositional wise, and then just go really uh, high contrast in my processing uh, to get the final look that I want. So on the left, you know, you might not immediately recognize what it is or understand what it is. On the right, maybe it's a little bit more obvious because the colors help uh, define what it is. Um, but again, it's abstract. I'm not really trying to tell you what, what it was in real life. I'm just trying to show you what I saw with the lines, the shapes, the curves, the intersections of, of the geometric shapes with the curves. Uh, back to parking lots. Uh, so in Colorado here, we're very environmentally conscious and we don't use a lot of salt um, on roads here. So this is back in my Maryland days um, after a snowstorm and parking lot had been covered in salt. Uh, this is at work, I think. And uh, then when the snow melted, and left that salt residue behind for a little bit and just kind of collects around the cracks of the pavement. And again, looks very uh, outer worldly or something of the night sky. And then, so now, of course I took this one and I'm like on the lookout for this after every snowstorm. Um, and so this is one where very fine cracks um, and it's created this little webbing uh, technique. Um, and let me show you couple more from this one. So I did a whole series. It's all of my smartphone because I was at work, didn't have my camera with me. Um, but this is what I saw. You know, I got out of work. There, there's my fancy pants, right? That I took photos of the inside of my pants. Uh, so I got my fancy pants on. 
Um, and so I stepped out of my car. I was like, ooh, that's kind of cool. And I'm like, ah, I don't have my camera with me, don't have my macro lens. But you know, I can still take a moment, enjoy the moment of, of finding the discovery um, and take a few photos with my smartphone. And again, these, these are high resolution. I'm not gonna probably be able to do much with these, but it's just uh, training my eye as well as just taking a moment to enjoy the interesting abstract that I found. Uh, trees, uh, upper left, this is a burnt log at a campsite. Um, so just had a lot of interesting kind of texture and, and gradient of color to it with how the charring was on it. And then the lower right uh, with a, a broken broken branch, um, just with interesting textures. And again, I take lots of these too. I could do a whole presentation just on trees. Uh, trees are one of my favorite subjects, uh, just a lot of character. Um, but again, just looking for pleasing compositions, mixing curves and lines, and then playing with some high contrast on my processing um, to get the look that I want. Uh, this is in Rocky Mountain National Park here. Forget what kind of tree this was, but had this interesting blue streak through it. Uh, so a bit of a, the bark had been broken off. Um, and so just interesting, kind of looked like flames or something. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, this is a log or something when I was out somewhere. It was just, uh, had been cut. Uh, so it was just the side of a log. Uh, but much like some of the other photos we saw, just that blend of oranges and curves and lines and texture. So. Yeah, you know it's some type of wood. Uh, but that's I'm not taking a picture of a tree. I'm taking a picture of line shapes, colors, um, and that gradient. This is at uh, Lana Coning Silk Bill, which I hear is now back open for tours. Uh, this is a bundle of like rayon fiber, kind of reminded me of like horsehair, uh, but it's some sort of artificial fiber that they had there, just a bundle of it, and so just come up roll close uh, i think let's take with a standard lens um but uh standard mean like a 24 to 70 not a macro um just a close-up and if you look around the image it's not perfectly sharp throughout the image but it doesn't need to be perfectly sharp throughout the end i could do hyper focal distancing or i could do focus stacking or i could have used you know f22 or something like that but that wasn't really important for this you know it's just uh, the curves and the, the the gradient of color or shade um, there. And so I only need parts of it to be sharp. I don't need the whole thing to be sharp. Uh, this is here in Colorado. This is in winter, uh, just some grass in a field. They've been knocked down. I'm walking with my family. And I just like that the grass is knocked over, kind of creating this bowl of spaghetti, kind of crisscross of everything. You know, a couple of leaves stuck in there. Um, so. You can, if you look closely, there's sort of a little curve that kind of starts in the lower right on the foot on the left, kind of curves up to the center left and then kind of arches back kind of creates a little bit of a V or something like that. Um, and then the one on the right, just uh, the same field of grass, just a different section of it. Um, and just a totally different processing, right? The, on the left, a sepia treatment, or sepia, as some people say. Uh, and then on the right, uh, more of that high contrast that I love in my black and white photos. If you look at my website, a lot of my black and white photos are um, high contrast. So really inspired by the work of Cole Thompson. Uh, he's a, a current photographer. He does a lot of like jet black, jet white um, kind of images. So really inspired by his work. Uh, some national park somewhere, I forgot where this one is, uh, but just a mud flow um, along a riverbed. And so it just kind of cracked. And again, just interesting colors here. And you're starting to see, and I'm starting to see actually, um, a, a trend here of this golden brown color uh, seems to be uh, throughout a lot of the photos of this presentation, not intended, um, but apparently that uh, is a common theme for me. Sorry, what's my phone here? This is uh, in Colorado and, and with abstracts, you don't always know scale. Um, so clear this is some type of rock face. Uh, this is massive. This is along the side of the road. This is probably um, 30 feet wide, uh, this. I'm standing across the road uh, with my camera. And if you look closer, you kind of see a face there in the middle. Uh, reminds me of one of my favorite artists, Bev Doolittle. Um, she was from a number of years ago, but she did a lot of uh, paintings with faces hidden in nature. 
uh, Bev Doolittle, D O Little. Um, so just a little bit of snow on the rock here to kind of offset and give it just a little bit more depth. But again, not a photo of the rock. You no, know, there's no mountain goat on there, although we have plenty of mountain goats here in Colorado. Um, but it was just about the textures, the lines, the intersections, the, the shades of gray. And apparently I discovered later a face in the middle there, or maybe a little cat. I don't know, a cat, or a little bear or something. Uh, so a few more rocks. Um, so I like finding these rocks on the left with a little bit of lichen uh, growing on them. And so this is taking at a horrible time of day. It's really strong light, uh, but it's creating some interesting shadows along the cracks, so, so not too bad. Uh, and then there on the right, something more in shade, uh, but just showing the cracks and the intersections of lines. So again, an abstract, not really a picture of particularly anything, just interesting colors and shapes, something for you to just look at and study and just allow your eyes to kind of dance around the image. So I'll end with this um, quote by Annie Leibowitz. And so I, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm inspired by all kinds of photographers. So as hopefully everyone knows, uh, Annie, a fam very, very famous uh, portrait photographer, does a lot for Vanity Fair and other big uh, Vogue and other high publication mag magazines, uh, but a people photographer. But she had this quote, one doesn't stop seeing, one doesn't stop framing, doesn't turn off and on, and it's on all the time. And that's how I see my photography. Oh, and hopefully I've uh, gotten that across in this presentation that I'm, my eyes are always on the lookout. Um, this can be very dangerous when I'm driving the car with my family and my wife's like, do you need me to drive? Because you keep looking out the window and staring at the clouds and you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, it's like, I just can't help myself. I'm always on the lookout. Um, so I'll leave you with that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you guys. If you have any questions or comments, uh, check out my website if you want to see uh, more of my work. Um, and thank you for having me. Well, thank you for spending the evening with us. Um, yeah, good. So, uh, well, I have to say I'm all juiced up now. I'm ready. <laughs> to, I'm ready to go out and be creative. You've really, it was a sense of um, fun and uh, yeah, and just being more aware of my environment. So thank you. It's very inspirational. So does anybody Great. have a question? Want to make a comment? So everybody turn on your video, audio. Come on back, everyone. Yeah, come on back. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll put out a question. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. So, uh, so you were saying you were talking about sense of scale with a lot of these macros. Did you uh, did you ever try versions of your macro images with and without uh, putting something in it to scale? And what did you think of them? Did you like them with or without the sense of scale? Um, I've done that. Like I said, like some of those beach scenes, for example, uh, you put a shell in there or I usually don't put things in there. I usually find things in there. Um, sometimes out in nature, like I, I said, I do a lot of photos like trees and stuff. I'll look for maybe an interesting colored leaf or something like that. And I, I don't know. I, I like it without. Um, I don't, I don't need the sense of scale for this type of work, especially. Um, I don't like it. And, and usually, um, I have to add something specific uh, to get a good composition. And I really don't like adding things to my image. Um, I like to just find things. Um, and I know some people are you know, purists. And they say, well, it's what's the harm in finding a pretty leaf and putting it in the proper position or uh, you know, carrying a bag of seashells with you and, and putting them in a, in a proper position. And if that's for you, great. Uh, for me, I like the discovery piece of it. So I kind of like to find it how I find it. And so a lot of times I just don't find the right marriage of um, objects to create that scale. So I just I just learned to do without. And it sounds like you like to keep things to people's imagination. Um, yeah. Right, right, right. I think there's a couple uh, uh, questions in the chat there, Sandy. Yes, I know. Um, we're getting a lot of, I think you can see it, Greg, as well, the chat. Yeah. Yeah, you're just getting a lot of great presentation. 
you do the kind of photography that I'm passionate about. Yeah, that's Tina. Oh, yes, yeah, she she does this. Um, I see this one from Lynn that says, uh, you commented several times that you wouldn't enter a particular image in a competition. Do you feel abstracts don't tend to place well? I know photography is inherently subjective, uh, but you feel it's especially so with abstracts. So yes, I mean, a lot, I don't, I don't enter a lot of competitions. Um, it, here in Colorado, there's actually a good number of galleries that uh, do promote photography and have uh, photography exhibits. Um, so I do enter those from time to time, um, but most of them don't have an abstract category uh, specifically versus, you know, competition will have a people category or a black and white category or a what nature category. So a lot of times the abstracts end up just being clumped into a nature category or an open category. And they're just, I think it's because the eyes, beauty's in the eye of beholder, they don't necessarily resonate with people. So my experience is they don't always fare very well um, unless it's a competition that has a dedicated abstract category. So I showed that one image of the tulip swipe uh, that did well at Nature Visions. Um, the amoeba one of the Chicago River, I entered that into a competition, um, uh, a national photography competition here in Colorado the other year. And it, it was an abstract category and it won first place. Um, so yeah, if there's a dedicated category for it, but if you're just throwing it into an open category or a nature category, um, doesn't always tend to fare well, is my experience, which unfortunate because I think my images are pretty cool. Um, I'd love yeah. to see them lining the walls of some, uh, you know, gallery or some um, hotel uh, printed out really big, but uh, alas, that's not happened yet. So, so if I could interject, I think here, Sandy um, and Greg, uh, I think the MPA competition is about to end either tomorrow or the next day. And it does have, I think, a macro um, category. It's one of the four categories. So all of you inspired tonight, hands them into that one. <laughs> It, nice. it, the last day is um, tomorrow. Is tomorrow? Okay, Friday, Friday the 20th, 30th, right? 30th. That's tomorrow night, yep. All right. But it's a macro category, not an abstract, isn't that right? Yeah, but. Yeah, I'm but not... even macro is better than open or Yeah, or but macro or gets, like a, that, so. gets a lot of bugs and flowers. It's true, actually, but so, so sometimes that's an advantage, right? Because the judge is like, I've seen so many close up spider pictures and be on sunflower pictures. Like I want something unique, something different. I actually entered um, an abstract into the MPA competition under the reflections category. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Well, I guess we're at the end, but Greg, again, thank you so much. You've been absolutely delightful to work with. And yeah, putting- I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and the presentation. Thank you so, so much. Great. Well, thank and you for thank having you. me again. <laughs> Thanks for an inspiring presentation. Are you going to come back and do some judging for us? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm, I'm ready when you are. I know I've judged for you guys once before. Um, and so, yeah, only a Zoom call away. I think Tom slipped out, but maybe, uh, Sam, you should send an email to Tom and give him that suggestion. <laughs> I was planning to, but Greg and I have been talking about that. And we're talking about something for the future. Um, uh -huh. Ooh, mysterious. Want... <laughs> so we got some ideas uh Excellent. so good all right everybody thank you for attending all right and thank Bye. you thank right. you everybody have a good night everyone good yes night. thanks okay. thanks everybody Bye -bye. good night thanks again greg